almost six years ago, like, like a week ago, I went down, so I took a month to try to design characters, and they were tigers initially, um, but then I realized that stripes is really boring to draw. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want all characters have the exact same fur. Exactly, I was like, just, it's all going to be too much orange. And then my husband suggested cats, because internet cats, everyone loves cats. And so, and they look more interesting, so we we'll get cats, and uh, yeah, and it just, I think I was originally going to have the, the family be, because it's going to be more of a Ben Tiger parody, um, but we decided to do like a draw what you know, and so we like made it more my family, and so yeah, it's based on so me, my husband, and our two kids, and so uh, yeah, it's just so it's been, it's been really fun to do, we've loved it too. <laughs> So I definitely want to dive more into this, but I want to say, remind again, especially if we have we have more people now. If you have a question, pop your hand up and we'll get to you as soon as we can. All right. Uh, let's start with that for a quick second. Um, since you're drawing stuff true to life, um, how did your family feel about seeing themselves in, in the, I was going to say animated form, but it was cartoony form? <laughs> uh, I think it's part of the kids are just so grown up with it. So they're what, seven and nine now, and that's six years ago. So it's just this sort of normal for them. Like, Thing you said is like a viral tweet, and they're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of comic about something that's I'm thinking about the world that we using I don't know some heavy handed metaphor or whatever, and then there's just like straight jokes or anything that happened to me or whatever, and I just find that as you know, since I'm just doing gag strips, there's no central cast of characters, so I find uh, it's often easy I need someone for the joke to be on the strip. Uh, I've drawn myself so many times. And I'm just right there, and it's easy, and that way it clues them. At this point, the reader understands that like it's okay to make fun that I'm making fun of me, but by describing uh, you know a behavior that I don't like, uh, I can make myself fun of the joke easily. Yeah, you you've already queried it yourself uh, as far as the legal is concerned. Yeah, like uh, my my lawyers are of course always on the phone with my lawyers about it, but that's <laughs> um, and the one thing that you said a minute ago was that. You, you initially tried a, 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 a more straightforward narrative approach, but really you feel like that didn't work out. Now mm -hmm. approach is approaching that. Um, as you've grown as a creator, do you think about going back to that original story and maybe recreating it better? <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, it was, it was, I think, sort of, I was, I was actually, I was giving a talk at uh, the Center for Cartoon Studies last month in Vermont, for a comics on the program, and I was, Going through a lot of my old work to like show uh, the students like where I came from and whatever, and I was looking at the old work and I was like, this is all salvage. <laughs> it was just sort of it was my, my it was my first attempt at anything because even when I was uh, like a little kid when I was growing up, was not like big long comics or anything. It was always always a scripts reader um, or like the far side or something it was always like more where I was in it. This lady here, but uh, you know, like I just it was always, uh, I was always just thinking more in those like short bursts, and it was a challenge to sort of turn that thinking into a web comic. And but that first time around just wasn't going, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't think I stuck with it long enough, maybe we were good. Um, but now I've, I've sort of I've been exploring, I've been doing the last couple of things, I've done some long form fiction things, and I've got a better hand. But I'm finishing up my third graphic novel right now. Um, so I've got a handle on it now, but I think when I was 25, I didn't have it. Fair enough. I was 
that, that moment has passed. Yeah. More than to move on. Yeah, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's good to know when a project is going. Fair. Yeah. Now, Scar, uh, the same thing. You also said that your initial attempt at, at having a, a narrative story. Not, not the best. Although you did stick with it for three years, you said. So I actually, again, not to one of you, um, <laughs> but I started posting comic scripts, like like fan made, like the little comic. Yeah. In like, I think I started my DeviantArt account in like 2007. Um, but I. Okay, that's not It was like 2002. So. Oh, well, I started mean, in the middle of the school. We can do this all day. Yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, so like, I actually, it's like, Opposite because I started um, making so I was big into like Calvin Hobbes when I was in like sixth and seventh grade. I like bought the big books from the collected book fair um, and I would just read them over and over again. I'm like, I do that. <laughs> so I did. I, would, I have like entire sketchbooks just filled with like little strips of my friend said something funny rather than just tell. Like my other friend is like, hey, listen, look at this stupid thing that so and so said. I just made a little comic and then I could be like, look! <laughs> and I did that for years and years and years. And then I eventually wanted to start posting online more. I started making them like, I started doing video game fan comics. A lot of those are still on my DeviantArt. And the Love Legend Cell that I did so many Ace of Bernie ones. Um, first all round for comedy, that series, I'll tell you what. An artist of culture. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then I did those all through high school, and then right at the end of my high school career, I was like, I kind of want to try and do something a little bit more long form, and then that's where my first web comic came from. Um, was like these characters that I kind of had in my head for a little bit, and then the, literally the day after I graduated college, I was like, I'm bored. I'm gonna make a web comic, and then I went for three years. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to have the audacity. To just do the thing, and sometimes you have an entire summer vacation and you're bored. Um, but yeah, so that was my first attempt at actually like writing anything that was not for school, and it was bad. But I learned a lot of lessons really quickly. <laughs> you learn that you don't have to spell out every single thing on a billboard to get your readers to understand what is going on in the story. Learned that real quick. Um, learned what image resolution was <laughs> about two chapters in. <laughs> I okay, you all scrimmage. Here's the thing. I made a video, because I make a lot of YouTube videos with my comic tips, and I made a video talking about it's like, hey, your comic program is probably set to like 72 or 150 dots per inch it is like dot per inch as the default. If you're planning on printing your comic, you should set it to 300 or more because the more pixels, the higher resolution is. And I got so many comments. It was like, this is basically everyone knows this. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't know that until I saw where you were college. Our college! Uh, so yeah, okay. You know, that's why it's important to get the basics out there because everybody People might assume I know this, so everybody knows this, but that's not the case. My one saving grace is that I drew my comic pages at like two times the size they needed to be, because you draw them so tiny, they get all crunchy and pixely. And so I was just like, well, if I just say it's huge, but also 72 DPI. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Listen, I taught myself Photoshop, okay? <laughs> my dad clocked me, my dad saw me trying to like color a traditional drawing that I scanned in in MS Paint, going literally pixel by pixel, and he was like, no, and he clocked me in front of Photoshop, I was like 12, and he said, go, and I said, okay! <laughs> and that's how I learned digital art, is I poke the buttons until things happen that I wanted to happen. By the way, first, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kevin Garcia. Uh, I am a special freelance writer for 25 years, so about 10 years I worked for Marvel Comics, uh, doing some handbooks, and I am also a high school teacher, where I teach magazine creation. And um, while it's just more convenient, also part of the class, to get them to work in vector images, if they want to do it on something else, I'm like, okay, just make it like three times the size that you actually want it, because I don't want to go into your settings. Just make it a really big picture, and then when I shrink it, it'll look fine. Yes. Like, I still, um, my web comic pages, I, uh, I draw them at 300 DPI, but I also draw them at like two times the size they need to be. Yeah. Because I don't know what's going to happen to me. 
<laughs> well, that brings us back to uh, your guys' current projects, mm -hmm. all right? Um, so, um, how did Cast Off start? Cast Off started, it sounds so corny, and I hate that I have to be tell the story every time someone asks this question, but it's true. Came to me a dream. <laughs> Fever dream, my freshman, my first semester of college. Um, was just like this, I, I described it as like a crossover between Lord of the Rings, which I had not seen, and Codeus, which I had unfortunately watched several times at that point. Um, and it was just like, that's literally where my main character came from. Um, he was like the main protagonist of this dream, and he was a butthole. And so I took it, I just loved the design of this character, like, what if I made him a nerd? And so over the next couple days, when I should have been paying attention in our history, I was Googling this character, I'm like, you're a nerd now. And I like just came up with a name for him. I came up with like this little backstory. I started adding new characters in the mix. There was a um, there was a like a school-wide comics anthology that was running about. I went to Scat, by the way. Um, and so <laughs> they're always trying to recruit my kids. Yeah, oh yeah. It's an okay school. Uh, I like it, but um, so I made like a pilot comic, and it was so bad because that lesson I said about you don't have to tell your audience every single thing about your character the instant they show up. I haven't learned that yet. Um, and so that comic was bad. Uh, but I did it. I made like 14 pages for it. I put it into this anthology. Um, and then the next semester, I had a color theory project where they basically just said, "Okay, here's the concept. Do whatever the heck you want." And I was like, "I'm a color that." That I made last semester. So then I did that. Um, and then I just kind of like, I kind of took a pause from it for a couple of years because I had my other webcomic that I was working on. Um, but then after I shelled that one because I realized it was bad, I didn't want to work on it anymore. I bounced cast off around in my head for several years. It was just like, you know, picking up momentum, picking up other ideas, picking up these concepts. And I was just like, once I finally got my first, like, actual I am making enough money to be a person job after I finished college, I was like, I've got all this free time now. Comic time. And so I just, I, for, the, so National Novel Writing Month is every November. It's only write 50,000 words a month. And I said, I'm going to do that, I'm going to remix it. Oh, I tried to write it as a novel first. Um, <laughs> so after I did that pilot comic, I tried to write it as a novel for Hannah Rye, but it was bad. Um, and then I came back to it a couple of years later, and I said, what if I use NaNoWriMo as an excuse to write 50,000 words of scripts for this comic? Um, and then that ended up being the first couple of chapters for the comic, and I just haven't stopped since. Honestly? Fair. <laughs> and I made four it, it paid my bills, literally, so. Maddie, can you tell us about uh, Boys Weekend? Oh, sure. What, what was the impetus behind this? I, I was looking at the little uh, uh, the tag on it next and I was like, it brought a smile on my face. Uh, it, it seemed cool. Yeah, so um, about a year or so after I'd come out, my a good friend of mine from college asked me to be his best man at his uh, bachelor party, or at his wedding, and then we went to a bachelor party in Las Vegas, and I had uh, sort of minor uh, existential meltdown um, while I was there. I got back and I was thinking about like, oh, I'm gonna like, I have this weird thing that happened to me. I'm gonna maybe make uh, like a mini comic about it or so I'm gonna do something with it. Um, just sort of like processing whatever was going on with me emotionally at the time. Um, and then I started working on it and then it just got stranger and stranger, bigger and bigger. Um, and then it was like all of a sudden a science fiction story that took place in like the near future. And there's like cults and monsters and uh, all sorts of other uh, bad stuff happening to everybody. And it sort of like became this like final girl novel very slowly. Um, and then I realized it was like a long book. And I, uh, and then it was just the, the process of pitching, like, you know, doing a sample chapter and uh, talking to my agent about it. And it was the thing where it was my, my fourth or fifth like graphic novel pitch. And the other ones hadn't gone. Um, so it was gratifying to like, but it was the first really personal story that I could tell, and I think that's what sort of like got me to a place where uh, it was appealing to other people. Uh, I, I love it as a, you're describing it as a personal story, but also with sci-fi, like monsters and the whole final growth scenario. Well, the thing is, it's really, to me, to keep it interesting to myself, like I just don't do slice of life stuff. Even when I was doing 
a book in our tutor week for 10 years for this. It was never like, here's a drawing of Ted Cruz. Here's what Ted Cruz said this week, because that's uh, it, like, incredible. That's gonna be the thing. Well, it was, it's hard for me to draw. I just don't care. I don't, I don't like drawing characters. Uh, I don't like just saying, like, here's whatever. Here it is. I was always like, how do I turn this into a scenario of like goo or a skeleton or <laughs> just something like an alien, something. So I was always okay, just like, though, he drew Ted Cruz as a skeleton <laughs> part of <a> goo. He <laughs> did. <laughs> 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 I did do one comic where it was a very gooey Ted Cruz. <laughs> but that's like one of the only times I actually bothered to like draw a real character, like a real character of somebody. Um, but it was always like, how do I just turn this into like genre fiction is always sort of my go-to for jokes, for serious thoughts. I'm just always there. That's just sort of how I process things. I just I read a lot of science fiction. I watch a lot of science fiction. That's just sort of you know, where I was at. And um, you said that you had uh, talked to your agent to, to get this out there. So um, uh, it's something I want to bring up to everybody in a second, but. But you are uh, you doing this through a institutional publishing company, or right? taking it up? Yeah, it was uh, Pantheon, which is under Alfred Knopf, which is under Big Grant. Because there is uh, there was a big five at one point. I think there's three now. One day it'll be zero. Um, but one day there'll be one. One day there'll be. I mean, there's kind of one. There's one that Bertels made me, which owns multiple. Anyways, it's. Not a great scene, uh, but uh, Pantheon's like a smaller imprint. They do a lot of, they publish graphic novels. They didn't publish graphic novels here, but they publish Mouse, Persepolis, uh, and me for some reason. But, um, you know, uh, but I had an agent, strangely, from writing a humor book I wrote in 2014 with my partner. There was like a, a dumb segment on a website called The Toast, which ran in the mid 2000s. There was, it was called Dad Magazine. It was a fake, we had a Photoshop fake magazine cover for a general interest magazine for dads, like for dads. <laughs> you know. Um, and it was like, you know, had a, the most annoying text to send your daughter this month. <laughs> um, and uh, for some reason, uh, a small publisher called Quirk wanted us to make a full issue of the magazine as a book. So we did that, and I got an agent sort of backwards that way. And then, she just hung off to me because she had some other graphic clients, but um, I kind of like fell a little bit ass backwards into traditional publishing, uh, but I also fell out backwards into being a fake book cartoonist. So it's you know. Have you done the way you did? Oh, that's a team. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there we go. For oh, closer. Okay. Uh, no, well, I was worried because I was worried that microphone wasn't picking anybody up. No. Uh, it was very hard. It's haunted. It's haunted by you. No, I mean, what I always tell people is like, it's at some point you have to get lucky. Like, there's no way to reverse engineer. God, I don't want to call it success because you know we're all barely hanging out here. I, I was going to say, falling, however you fall, into something you enjoy doing is worth it regardless. No, exactly. But what I'm, what I'm saying is like, you know, if you want to make your career or you want whatever, it's so like people ask like. What kind of form should they publish or not? What should my comic be about? I'm like, that you're worrying about the wrong thing in the wrong order, right? It's like, do the stuff you like to do, uh, finish the projects that you start, um, and just just work on the crack and put yourself in a position to get lucky because you do have to. Someone, that the right person has to see your work or spread it around, or it takes a long time to build the money, it's whatever it's all about. <clears throat> At some point, you do have to get sort of lucky. And you are going to feel like you got lucky forever. Um, which is how I feel, certainly. Um, but it, it's just about putting yourself in a position to put up that would happen. And then, and then Jessica, I want to ask you um, we already talked basically about uh, Litterbox Comics, but I want to ask um, was becoming a cartoonist something that you would have always wanted to do? Uh, did you just kind of like have a funny idea that it became a thing? Uh, how, how did you involve in, in web comics at, at all? Uh, I'll take a little bit back. Okay, so at school, <laughs> I was the cartoonist at the top, so I was always just drawing everything. Um, you know, I just draw covers of books, I think books and books. <laughs> um, I draw covers for like, books, well, teacher books, and we like, you know, it was a little 
really cheesy bit. <laughs> and broadcasting is for their book. Um, and then, gosh, it was fairly like family Christmas cards, so there'd be far funny ones for that. I always did some comments myself when I was younger, also not. <laughs> um, and then I kind of I drifted about a bit. Uh, I did freelance. I went to school for animation um, for, and I dropped out after a year. I met my husband, and, <laughs> and that's another story. But um, yeah, then I did freelance for a bit, doing like you know drawings for that. Um, then I started, I started a company. No, <laughs> so I started playing sport a lot, so it was a <laughs> game on PC, which is awesome. And I was making really good sport characters, and then I was like number five in the world of sport. Yeah! <laughs> and then I realized that this was stupid, and I wasn't making any money. So I went on to a website called Zazzle, where you could do like t-shirt designs, and so I was doing t-shirt designs on that, actually making some money. Um, and then I moved, I, they're always pets. I, I love animals, I love pets. And so I tried to draw everyone's pets. And so I sit, set up a Zazzle store where I was drawing everyone's pets. Um, but there's so many different pets. So I designed another store which was like a, uh, it was called Cartoon Land My Pet. And it was a, um, like avatar creator for pets. And so you put your pet in and then you cover it. And then it was basically my way of doing characters and pets without dealing with people. Because <laughs> they just do it themselves. Like and draw the parts. You yeah. Just you do stick it together, put it on a t shirt, off you go. Yeah. Uh, so I did that, and then that was doing all okay, okay, but there's a lot of, you know, the pet drawing was fun, but then you have to draw, like, the brown one, the, you know, the one with these markings, one with those markings, it was awful. And so I had kids, or well, my first kid, and I was like, oh, I can't keep doing this cartoon out of my pets, it's boring. And uh, and just on the day when I was like, all right, I'm going to stop, a lady came along and emailed me asking to buy the company, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so I sold it to her, and then I was mum for a bit, and I was like, what can I do? Previous, going back to previous story where I was like, what should I do? Trying to make my art into something for kids. Um, and then, yeah, I just sort of, I couldn't, it took a few years, I don't know how old. I don't even remember the date of the company, I was um, But yeah, I just had this Eureka moment. You were just past kittens and not quite it. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of, yeah, I did cartoons a lot of time. I guess the long, the short version is I did them a lot when I was little, and then I kind of moved away into more illustration, but it was always there. I always liked sort of telling stories and comic strips and stuff. And so yeah, it just sort of hit me as a sort of like, what is this again? Yeah, it was, um, like foul language and hedge humor, but they kept coming up in all the mum groups. So I was like, I could do that, I could do that. So yeah, I just sort of picked it up again, and that's why I sort of, it looks like that came out of nowhere, but I did have a lot of history of <laughs> figuring, my, figuring things out before they got me. <laughs> you know, I, I was talking about, you know, sort of creating the characters and designing them and all kinds of stuff as you were going. I remember you did, did one about somebody complaining or pointing out they weren't scientifically accurate cats. Well, you can't see the penis barbs. Like, I don't know. <laughs> no, well, it's the calico. Calico cats have like XXY chromosomes, right. so they're like sort of boy dogs. Uh, oh no, they're all girls. Oh, but yes. there's rare ones that are boys, so they do exist. They're normally sterile. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, you haven't introduced your son yet. <laughs> but yeah, I was, when I was, because he got the, the idea behind the colors were like, you know, he's half man, he's half doll, and he's a bit of a mess. And I was like, it looks good, but I was like, I knew Calico couldn't really exist as boys, and I was like, it looks like hair, and I was like, right, this is, <laughs> this is my friend. They're like, no one else will care. <laughs> There's always somebody in the <laughs> Comics, but I want to point out again that you have questions. I'll put my hand up and I'll get to you as soon as I can. 
Um, so I want to start with you here. That you had success on webtoon, right? And, and I want to talk to each of you about like how you've been publishing in different ways. Um, webtoon is like I talk to my students because uh, I teach high school, and almost all of my kids read webtoon. You know, but you also need to talk to us. How did that come about? And how does that work out for you? When I started, I get my Twitter bursary coming around, so I know exactly where I, I went and just got all of the ones I put in the Facebook. Um, but yeah, I started on web to have that same time to be like the post to those kind of posts and memes and uh, I didn't even really know what was going on there, I just sort of left it. Um, and for some reason web to got really big big and that that's has I don't know why. I, don't, I imagine someone is pulling the string, or maybe it's different. I don't know. But I definitely I got a feature on webtoon. It was that early, because they didn't give me like front page feature updates yet. But I think yeah, you can probably get very lucky. I'm sure people are actually you know trying to get other people on webtoon. I think say what I did. But anyway, I didn't realize there were comments on there until like a year ago. It was a bit of like shit. There's people here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's how you got your first feature. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I got it pretty early on. Um, I think it's probably like a bit of like a bit of Talked about working with publisher, right? Yeah. Um, when you first, when you've done most of your work online, what how have you done that? Like, like I think you started with Instagram. Yeah. So I uh, in like 2008 or nine, I built my first site. So I had a WordPress site with some comics. Uh, Skin that you put on it, but it's only for web comics specifically. But like, really, I kind of work for you for what you want and stuff. Um, and that was just the way to do it. Like I, I knew some people that were like more like legacy web comics folks that were doing since like the 90s. And uh, I asked one, like, what do you do? He just sort of showed me. Um, but that was just the way it was kind of done. He was like, people have access feeds and of those, number of websites, um, people go to them. Um, so I just did it that way because that was just how you did it. And you just sort of prayed that people found it. Like, I had a Twitter, but it was, you know, in 2009, I had, you know, 100 followers or whatever. So it was just sort of sending the links out on, so like my network of people is hoping so I would go to conventions and sell me, you know, put it on the website, you know, just the, the things you do. Um, and then over time, it was sort of, I was posting on, you know, the mid, which was like a really good way to get my name out there because it just had a lot of readers. Um, and that was about after I got noticed on Twitter by the, by the editor. Everybody from that course, and the, the editor in chief, they were like, That was for the, the, for the magazine. For the what was the website that ran today. Oh, and then the magazine magazine. Yeah. Um, but that was just before I just saw a comment of mine floating on my Twitter and emailed me, like, Do you want to do comments on our site? Um, which is, again, getting lucky, right? Because um, you just happened to see it getting reviewed by, I don't know, somebody. Um, and then I was posting there, and I, mean, I, I was maintaining, like, oh, it's like, it's been my work every week for years, and then, like, 2017, I was like, nobody's going, I was looking at the numbers, and I was like, no one's going to the website, I'm getting a more engagement from people looking at comments on Twitter and Instagram, I was posting there, and so I paid around, and why did it then, in 2016, I don't remember exactly when I started, but I was like, I'll put the comments on Patreon, and not worry about my website so much anymore, because nobody was like, Fewer people are going to URLs and typing in, yeah. I want to go to this account. Like, there used to be time loans when I was a child. <laughs> um, you know, like, I had like, like, a favorite thing, I'd go to like 20 websites today and read all the comments. Um, but that's just a wall. That's just a wall. And that's like the way the internet kind of sort of like siloed and yeah. every, every, every website has a wall card and they're allowed to leave and post them to get people trying to make this hard. Um, so like yeah, you kind of just have to go where you can meet people where they are. Um, I never went on Webtoon or any of those just because I never uh, bothered. Because I'm like, oh, I just I didn't. 
I, I just feel like I'm too old now to start trying to connect. I was gonna say I never thought I'd heard of you. But yeah, certainly. Uh, but like I said, I don't know. I just uh, maybe I'll get on fire eventually. But I just, I, I just I'm just not familiar with the landscape over there, and I don't know. Like building a following somewhere is so hard, and like I already have one. It's this thing where this is not big like website UI design. Every time you try to give a click a link, you lose like. 50 to 70% of people. It's like any point we go to, you even just a new social media site follow you, you lose almost everybody, like immediately, just because there's so, for whatever reason, people like see that you have to click and there's like, ugh, too much work to click away from my mouse or my phone or whatever. I don't, I mean, it's just one of those weird things you get with it. So it's, it's really hard to transfer people around. So that's what you do is just get people signed to play. I have a newsletter too now, which is like, because I thought social media becoming a little harder to get through to people sometimes. Um, like, to be able to test an algorithm is so scary to me. And these companies have done a private messenger, it's hard at all. Um, so, like, just sign up for it. I just want your email. And when I do work, I can email it to you. That's the best way to do it, I think. I like that. I, yeah, I was thinking about you know, social media mm -hmm. and webtoon, but like just direct, to, well, that's also what Patreon is too, really. Yeah, we did. Just direct to the, to the reader, I guess. Yeah. Um, now, Star, you've used different methods too. Can you talk about some of the ways that you've gotten cast off out of people? So many different Okay, so <laughs> my, my thing was that I was like, I Um, and 
You also, like, you have your own UI. You can theme the entire website around exactly what you want it to look like. You can add extra stuff. Like, I have a page on my website for character playlists because I'm one of those nerds. Um, I have a play. I have a. Uh, I have a page for like extras with like links to all the other web comics I read. And you know, like with webtoon and tapas, you can sort of put those in there, but not really. They really just want you to only post the comic and shut up. Is kind of what it feels like sometimes. And I'm like, but I do not shut up. At, at the most on webtoon, I'll see at the bottom of the comic, they drew an extra panel that was go see my friend's web comic because it's really interesting. Yeah, but the thing about webtoon is they don't let you have hyperlinks. Yeah, you can't click. You can't click on they it. They just like search for it. You have to rely on other people to go searching for it. They're not gonna freaking do that. <laughs> I, I think this thing that would take for webtoon actually is you don't really have to write them up in the panels. Like I do that now because it does seem to go over a little better. But when I got big on webtoon, I was just going posting the full page comic and leaving it. Like you don't need to. So that's, you know, it might as well. Like, well, well it, it, yeah. it helps <laughs> that you have large fonts. Oh, yeah. yeah, but I think for a lot of them, they're trying to come on a full, like, eight, eight and a half by 11 page. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, oh, how did you reformat your web comic for what? I didn't. <laughs> I literally just posted it exactly the way it is. And everyone's like, this isn't scroll friend. I'm like, I didn't make it for what to do. Go read it on the website. <laughs> and they're like, why don't you format it? Like, there's 750 pages of this thing. You think I have the time? I barely have time to breathe. <laughs> so, a minute ago, you used the expression to be to have free eyeballs on it, right? Yeah. Uh, I want to ask all of you this question, so I feel like this applies to all of you one point or another. How do you feel about when a comic goes viral and it just starts being shared on other people's Twitter and stuff like that? Where, uh, I'll be honest, very often they for some reason, cropped off the names. <laughs> this is why I sign inside a panel. Uh -huh. That's why it's written in huge letters, right there. But see, even then, if people wanted to be douchebags, they Oh, 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 oh I do they want to be douchebags? Yes. Yes. They, they do and they can and they are, but, you know, um, that's something, I mean, it's the sort of thing where there was a time, and I, Again, it's my experience now, it's different than my experience when I was first starting out, which is like the reason I got my first paid comics job, just making comics for money, was because it, it opposed to my viral, right? So it is like integral to get eyeballs and like hopefully convert some of those people um, to readers, you know, just people who read the work. That's the, the goal, and everything else is done shooting that. Um, money, whatever, I guess, not. You can't, it's hard to think of it that way, you're gonna have to make worse stuff. But getting readers is important, and you want people to read the comic, right? Um, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But, like, at this point, a lot of the time, something like get containment, I'll call it, uh, and get into like a different part of. Yeah, the mic just kind of is his image. It doesn't want to hear the truth. <laughs> 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 it's fine, I'm very loud. Um, yeah, but you gotta be allowed all weekend. Oh, that's true. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, that one gets you from about a real series. That one gets you from about a foot away. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, like, um, for me, there's one like sometimes a, a, a comic, uh, especially as, as someone who makes political work often. Uh, when something breaks containment, it's no good. I don't think. <laughs> because you get, it's either like chuds, you know, from the sewer yelling at me, which, yeah. And at this point, I appreciate nothing, the reference. Not like at this point, nothing can hurt me emotionally. You can't, whatever. Or it just, you know, people like, there's a real worry, there's people engaging in like the absolute worst way possible looking for something to, I don't know, like be like this comic about your experience doesn't apply to mine, and that's a problem. For some reason, uh, like it's my fault. Like the, the four panel comic you can't take into account with the entire way and read the whole human experience. I, I, I feel like that's that's only reasonable expectation. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing it on purpose to make people mad. That's right. Yeah, and like you know, it's I don't know. It's just it's a it's a real mixed bag out there these days. I will say, as as a as a fan, you know, it always frustrates me when somebody does. This really amazing, uh, you know, comic that goes really viral, goes around everywhere, but doesn't have their name on it. Because I'm like, if I enjoyed it, I want to find more of it. So I've actually gone through the effort of like uh, seeing how many steps it took me to find the actual page, and be like, there, it took me three minutes. 
Yeah, the piece was bad. Um, but uh, I, I just feel like artists should be recognized, I guess. Yeah, I, will, I have on more than one occasion seen a post of like, uh, uh, something I drew, uh, like on like, a post of like, some aggregator account has found and posted. And just writes like, who drew this? With like a bunch of emojis laughing, so my name's on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's on it's on it, actually. Um, well, something else that was brought up a second ago was AI. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, this isn't really a panel for AI, but since it came up a minute ago, I wanted to kind of ask you guys uh, how how do you feel about what's, what's going on right now with, with arts and, and AI? Because I think a lot of you worked with commissions before, and one of the things I'm hearing is a lot of people who get commissioned now there is that concern that people are going to go to a machine instead of a person. Yeah. My thoughts on it are, this is gonna sound boring and I apologize, but like, my other stuff. <laughs> um, I feel like most of the AI art you see is very much just like, soft anime girls. And I draw like that. <laughs> very defined lines, like I use a lot of spot blocks and I'm like, I haven't seen an AI do that yet, so for right now, I think I'm okay. Um, I think AI is just the new NFT, and people are just, all the tech nerds are like, oh my god, it's the new hit thing! Oh my god, we're gonna make a billion dollars! How much is your apes worth now, bro? That's <laughs> like a year, year and a half. My apes are gone. My apes. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, should have title this book. Yeah. I feel like it's a, it's a fad, people are all excited about it, I don't think it's, I mean, it, it, knock on wood, but like, I don't think it's going to be too big of an issue. It, it's like how they say it's like, oh, photography's going to get rid of painting, and yeah, um, I, I just feel like people are getting real excited about it because they see it as, oh, I don't have, so when you're an artist, every artist goes through this. There is a phase when you are first starting out when you will suck. Um, you, usually, hopefully, you do this when you're a child and you don't care, but especially if you're trying to learn a new skill as an adult, a lot of people will quit early on because they can't get over the suck phase. They're like, no, I tried to do this and it sucked and I'm never going to do it again. And I feel like a lot of the AI bros, if I can call them that, um, they don't like the suck phase and they see this as a shortcut through the suck phase. But then, if their tool stops working, they have to face the suck phase, and they don't want to do that, so they're just going to quit, yeah. right? And I think, I think, crucially, that that phase where you suck mm -hmm. is so integral to uh, your life as an artist. Yes, because that's where you learn how to get good at having ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's just like you can't do the thing without doing the thing. Is I feel pretty strong. The, the actual concern I have about AI stuff is I make a decent chunk of my living doing like illustration for like websites like editorial illustrations uh like if, you know a website has like a thumbnail image or whatever over a piece or an article or an op-ed or whatever yeah. there's some places where I'll, I'll draw that um and i'm lucky that a couple most of the places i work for like small or worker owned or co-ops or you know something like that so i'm less concerned about those places screwing me over but i, I do know like my my partner is a journalist and she was on the bargaining committee um, for her website uh, last year, and they'd be really direct and use a lot of strong language to not let AI encroach on that side of the business. Like people were starting to use AI for image centers and stuff because it was way cheaper, you know, free, it's convenient. And convenient and fast and whatever. If you want an illustration, you just be like, I want, you know. It's, it's easy to just ask it to get like a really boring looking illustration for free and fast um, instead of commissioning, you know, me, who's slow and expensive. But um, really that's like one place I know this happened at, but just there's so many more of these publications that are, that don't have a union to fight for yeah. the, the freelancers or, you know, they're run by like the worst VC people of all time, which is almost every publication now. Um, so there's a real concern that they're going to like eliminate a market for a thing, and by the time that they all realize that it is just another apes, um, it'll, it, it will have been hollowed out so badly that we're not going to claw back that space. Um, 
So it's like important when you see your favorite podcast or website or whatever using AI art for their Instagram or their thumbnails or whatever to tell them that it sucks. And they can do it like, <laughs> like truly, unless you want to keep seeing it. I, I want to say I really appreciate that a minute ago you said that it's important to go through that suck phase, right? Uh, both of you talked about your first edition, first, first comic, things you're not proud of. And then you talked about doing that pet maker that was like, I did it and it worked, but you got bored with it very quickly. Yeah. Um, so all of you kind of went through that process to kind of um, eventually create. So I want to ask you guys about that. But before I do, we have about a uh, little about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, go ahead. I was actually uh, pretty intrigued by like what y'all were saying about the AI, specifically like that suck phase too. I do want to jump off of that, but also the talk on like the business aspect and like the inclusion of the NFT growth, I guess. I guess the way I kind of see it with the whole AI debate is that like a lot of these people I don't think are approaching it as art as much as they are tools, not tools specifically, but like money making tools, business making tools. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really, really great. Uh, and I think um, it is kind of interesting seeing that interplay because, like, whenever the argument brought up for AI art, it's not that they're thinking about the art, they're thinking about the AI. So I'm trying to phrase this into a question, I guess. I'm not very well, good. Well, let's put it this way Can AI still be used as a tool by artists? Not like, say, draw the page for me. But like, are there ways in which you might use it? Like, for example, yeah, I'm I say absolutely yes. I, like, I'm a rush man. Like, I don't know. Like, people use that already. Yeah, yeah like, there you go. Like, what's they say? We're gonna rush. I'm like a cold rush in Photoshop. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh. Do you want this? <laughs> I I don't talk about this. I don't know. Okay. 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 Is just like, again, like what I'm worried about actually people getting thrown out of the industry 
because the people with money are just so interested in kicking us all off because they're they hate art, so they don't understand it. They're resentful of artists often. Yeah, um, I've seen so many bad takes on Twitter of people being like <laughs> of people being like, oh yeah, freaking artists making so much money. <laughs> and they're like, this is be like, I want some of that money. I'm like, no, this me is too. The one we're <laughs> I've been a professional writer for years, and I always joke with my students that if it wasn't for spell check, I wouldn't get a job. You know, that's AI. Yeah. But it, but also, you know, like a few years ago, I got hired to write a children's novel, and it was very much like there's somebody else I'd be and all other stuff. And after a lot of this, uh, the chat GPT stuff came out, I'm like, I can easily see them just saying, well, can we just have it write one chapter at a time? You know, and, and they're like, it's for kids anyway. And I, I, I can easily <laughs> see it. Sorry. I hate it when people like talk down to kids like that so much because like those are the future artists. So, so just for the record, uh, my, my, my book is about uh, teenage blue stories fighting against the folklore creatures. Uh, so out of curiosity, I, I went to check the team and said, you know what, write me a chapter. And every chapter I had to write me always ended the same way with the kids learning a lesson about fighting the Iona. <laughs> to make comics was reading things as a child that were good, that changed my brain chemistry when I was a kid. And like you find those big things that will stick with you for the rest of, you, of your life. You find them as a child and they stick with you. Those are the things that make artists, are the things that you find when you are that young that like drive you to this. Like Becky Howard and Hobbs when I was a kid was huge for me. Finding for me Tokyo Mewi was another thing. I love that manga. It has stuck with me for years. Sometimes I wish it didn't. But I, I found out about it in sixth grade. And it's not, I wouldn't have cared. I would have thrown it out with bad water and I wouldn't have given a heck. But it is like, just because it's made for kids doesn't mean it gets to suck. Honestly, I would say, if you're going to make something for kids, kids are brutal. Like, if they see something that they don't like, they will get mad. Because, <laughs> like, I would argue that the best things have to be made for kids. Yeah, it's hard to make kids. Like, I, I tried to make adults the movie exactly once, and I was like, this actually sucks, and I hate it. <laughs> I mean, but like, when you're writing it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, no, for real, though. It's like, when I'm writing for, because my stuff is mostly for, like, anywhere from teens to young adults, and it's like, you know, you can kind of leave a lot of stuff up to inferences, you can kind of, like, add a lot of nuance into it, but kids' stuff, it's like, it does need to be simple, but it also needs to work. Yep. And it's just, it's, a, it's challenging. And I have so much respect for people who write kids stuff because, yeah. like, I could not do that. Well, one last thing. Mm -hmm. um, since you were talking about uh, making things because you want to make them, so that, um, this is the webcomics panel. And tomorrow, there will be one all about how to make webcomics. I don't know who's going to be doing that one, but I hear that, that they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably going to hear them loud. <laughs> better. Um, but I want to ask you, you real quick, um, if you had one piece of advice to give somebody who wanted to start a webcomic, what would you tell them? Um, that's the easiest thing. I guess, actually, no, hold on. Um, try to make it be something about it visually interesting. Uh, like, uh, you were talking about earlier about the um, uh, website goes viral. Yeah, I'm lucky because my cats are quite, you know, people are like, oh, I've seen that cat before, that orange cat. And so, you know, I've got friends who do, like, you know, the, uh, don't just do, like, a stick figure guy. If you do a stick figure guy, they do something with the stick figure guy. Maybe people, a distinctive stick figure Yeah, so people are like, that's that guy. Like, I've seen that before, because part of the thing with webcomics is you need to build up a, um, and there's some ways to look at it and go, I've seen that before, that was funny before, I'll read this one too, and then keep going. Because that's, you know, especially if there's a little word, there's not many words, but I do want to do put too many words in until we've got a book. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's very good. My, my advice is a quick one, which is just start small, and just don't be like, I'm going to start my 2,000 page, even five chapter <laughs> comic. Where my, where my precious OC, that I love so much, I can save the world, like right off the bat, because uh, you're never going to finish it and you're going to want to scratch my 400 pages. And just like do a project, start and finish it. 
and just do that over and over until you're ready to roll what you're doing. I mean, honestly, I kind of said it earlier, but it's like, make the stuff that you're excited about. I would say it's just like, if you're worried about getting into comics because you want to make a career someday, or you're worried about like what's marketable, what's going to get people to read, you need to be making comics for yourself and like the 30 weirdos who are into the exact same stuff that you are. <laughs> And once you find those, but see the thing is that those 30 weirdos have friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's like literally how my webcomic picks up readers is um, you get your audience, you get your tiny little audience, and then you say, go tell your friends. Like, go tell, it's like, you just ask people, it's like, hey, if you like this comic, it would really mean a lot if you go like tell people. And so that's how you get your stories out there. You don't worry about what's marketable. Um, what's going to, what's a popular genre these days? What's going to make sure that I get career in comics? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Worry about making the stuff that drives you so crazy that not making it just makes you lay in bed at night switching. Um, you need to be so excited about what you're making. Make the thing that you wanted to read when you were a kid. Make the thing that's going to excite you so much that you can make 2,000 pages of it. Because otherwise it's gonna be a slog and you're gonna learn to not like it because if your comic is just work, then it's gonna suck. But if it's fun work, it will suck less. <laughs> and on that beautiful note, <laughs> uh, thank you all, thank you to our guests. Uh,